recording and there we go well welcome everybody thank you very much for joining a, another session of the evening chats um, with me tonight is dr trini gonzalez and um we'll be reporting he'll be reporting on uh la matanza tonight um and before i kind of unleash him on this uh, one i just wanted to um kind of an express appreciation um trini for you bringing this to our community i know you uh led the effort to, to put a landmark in san benito commemorating uh this tragedy um this is i think uh, an, a history that's indicative of a problem in mexican american uh, involvement in u.s history um before i moved here um like many things about mexican americans um and particularly this event, I, I had never even heard it referenced. Um, and so you, you do deserve a great deal of recognition for bringing this uh, to the forefront, at least in this community and any effort you brought uh, from without this community. Um, one of the things um, that I share with my students at the beginning of the semester, especially in History 1301, is I assign uh, chapter one from Howard Zinn's A People's History. And one of the reasons why I do, and I think it's indicative of this, of what you're about to share with us, is um, I'll go ahead and put it in the chat box, this quote from him. And I usually have students, I offer students a, an essay assignment um, looking at this um this quote from chapter one but basically he's explaining his his approach to history and um I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it my viewpoint in telling the history of the united states is different that we must not accept the memory of states and by states he means government um, the memory of states as our own nations are not communities and never have been the history of any country presented as the history of family conceals fierce conflicts of interests sometimes exploding most often repressed between the conquerors and conquered masters and slaves capitalists and workers dominators and dominated in race and sex and in such a world of conflict a world of victims and executioners it is it is the job of the thinking people as albert camus suggested not to be on the side of the executioners so um, I think when we get through this presentation that you're about to offer us and through Q&A that this quote will definitely reveal itself to be quite relevant uh, to why, why this event um, has been essentially basically hidden, I think, from history textbooks and from the general discourse when it comes to, to history or, or politics. Um, but with that said, I'll, I'll let you um, uh, carry on with your presentation. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. I uh, want to thank uh, Sean for allowing me to, to do this presentation and bring a history that, uh, while I teach to my students, uh, I know many in the community are, are not that familiar with it, although that is changing. It has been changing over the last uh, five, six years that we've been as a project moving this history, history excuse me, to the public domain. Now, just uh, before I get started, uh, I, and Sean, I went ahead and recopied it and uh, Uploaded okay. lesson up before in the chat box. You're gonna find uh, probably first for some of you uh, a link to the Ranger hear hearing transcripts. They've been digitized. There are three volumes, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There are three volumes of the investigations into the Rangers and their killing, uh, sanctioned by the state of Texas of Mexicanos along the border, as well as other individuals. Then I've also linked uh, some books that you can check out from our library that deal with this history. And I'll mention those books in a minute. And then also provided a link to CNN where I'm interviewed along with others who are descendants of the Matanza uh, that aired in uh, 2019. Uh, unfortunately, a month before the El Paso massacre that was almost 100 years later to the Puerto Benin massacre. And then here's a, a, something that just came out today from El Paso news station about the Port Benid massacre. Port Benid is a city outside of El Paso where 15 men and boys were executed by the Rangers, ranchers, and U.S. soldiers. 
so these are resources you could look at later. Uh, I think Sean might also share them with uh, whoever wants them as well. Uh, so just look at the chat and, and see what you find there uh, and what might be of interest for your further research to learn about this topic. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen uh, with the PowerPoint uh, as we go through the presentation. Okay. Got it. So uh, Refusing to Forget is a award-winning public history project. Uh, and this project started in 2013 at a conference in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, the conference was the National Association of Chicano Chicano Studies Texas Conference. And what we did at that meeting in 2013 was lay out what we wanted to do concerning bringing this history one, to a larger audience, because as academics, as historians, as scholars, we knew this. Me, personally, I knew this growing up as my own story, uh, because my great-grandfather and his father were killed by the Rangers in 1915 during the Matanza. Uh, but a lot of people did not know this history. That was one objective we had, because we're coming up on the 100-year anniversary in 2015 of the Matanza. Secondly, the way the history had been told predominantly uh, to the public was that the individuals killed were bandits. And what we found is that the killing of these individuals usually related to individuals who had land uh, and they were far from bandits. But the history and the history books and in museums and in public rhetoric about these events was all those bandits along the border uh, and they needed to be killed by the rangers in order to bring safety and peace along the border. Much like today, uh, the border back uh, in the early 20th century, contrary to popular belief, was pretty safe. Now, there's gonna be insurrection in 1915, and I'll talk about that, but that's in response specifically to law enforcement killing of individuals and the taking of land from individuals as well, which law enforcement helped in some instances. So what we want to do is twofold, bring this history to a wider audience that wasn't aware of it, uh, and also uh, reject and, and bring to the forefront the facts of what occurred 100 years ago, which was that the individuals killed were not bandits uh, and that the state of Texas was, was directly involved in the killing of these individuals. So uh, we're gonna talk about this project as I go forward and then narrow in into La Matanza, which is a history that occurred here in the Lower Rugan Valley. So Refusing to Forget was composed of five members originally. Those members included uh, John Moran Gonzalez, uh, the director of the Center for Mexican American Studies at UT Austin, also from Brownsville, myself from South Texas College, Sonia Hernandez, also from the Valley. Uh, she's at Texas A&M University in history. Benjamin Johnson, who is at Loyola uh, University in Chicago, has written a book uh, about the uprising or the insurrection uh, during this time period. And Monica Munoz Martinez, whose book just came out last year, has won several national awards that looks at this history, but particularly looks at how descendants have preserved this history, history despite uh, the state denying its existence. And then Christopher Carmona just joined last year. Uh, we are expanding the board on the Refusing to Forget team as we reorganize and, and going to continue the project. Originally, we were going to end the project after we accomplished our goals. Uh, we did not foresee the project uh, expanding and gaining as much interest uh, as it has. Uh, Refuse and Forget is won a national award for public history last year for the American Historical Association. We also are going to receive another national award, but I cannot reveal it because they don't want to reveal it until uh, April. So I, I thought I'd be able to talk about that today, uh, at least mention it today, our, our second national award, but we're not able to do that right now. I'm not able to do that right now. So I'm sorry for that. So let's get into the initial goals of Refusing to Forget. Uh, the first thing we want to do is create a website as a resource. And I believe Sean has shared uh, that website on the page or had it up earlier. Uh, and, and this website has been very helpful and for us getting information quickly to individuals who ask. Um, you go to the website, the one page that gets utilized is the history. 
And in that history, you, you can learn about all the things that are going on that we were looking at during the 1910s across the state of Texas concerning the state-sanctioned killing of Americans. Now, let me talk about what I mean by state-sanctioned killings. These are killings done with the official approval of the state of Texas, or in this case, any government, when you say state-sanctioned. The officers engaged in the killing were law enforcement officers, and after they killed individuals, even though it was clear that they arbitrarily killed individuals, and we're not talking about people who were resisting arrest and they get killed in the process of being subdued. These are individuals who were in jail, pulled out of jail and executed, or they went to the home and simply executed them in front of their family members. Uh, so these were law enforcement individuals who did this. This was mainly Texas Rangers, sometimes vigilante groups along with the Texas Rangers, and sometimes the U.S. military, and sometimes local law enforcement. So what a state sanctioned killing is, is where the state of Texas is very clearly aware of this. Uh, in the testimony that comes out in the, in the hearings concerning the Rangers, sometimes it's called the Canales hearings, because I'll talk about Canales in a minute. He's the state representative who started the investigation. Uh, an individual from the Valley uh, stated that the governor of Texas, before the killings or while the killings were going on, indicated that any officer who was brought up on charges of murder would be pardoned. So the governor offered a pre-pardon to allow law enforcement to engage in the killing of individuals so that they, they did not have to worry about uh, any criminal charges being uh, issued or brought against them for the killings of the, these individuals. So they're given a free hand. The argument for allowing the free hand of the killing of Mexicanos along the border was that Mexicans as a race, and I put race in quotes, uh, were inherently dangerous and needed to be treated that way and not treated the same as any other individual. What we are, as I said, what we're, what we're finding is that those individuals tend to also own land. Right? Um, so one thing we want to do is get a website to get this information out there. The next thing we want to do was to have a museum exhibit talking about this history. In particular, we wanted a museum exhibit in the State Museum of Texas, which is the Bullock Museum. Uh, and then we want to create a traveling exhibit based on that exhibit. The exhibit, as we'll see in a minute, was able, we were able to produce. That exhibit won national awards as well. And it was the first time the state of Texas, through a state cultural institution, acknowledged the killing of Mexicanos along the border and the injustice that that was at the hands of state officials. Historical markers. We wanted to have physical markers throughout different parts of Texas that talked about this history. Because once the markers go up, they can't go down. We originally had five marker ideas that we wanted to have placed. And I'll talk about the one that was not accepted by the state of Texas. The first is the Matanza marker of 1915. That currently is between the road of San Benito and Brownsville. The reason we selected the path between San Benito and Brownsville was a practice where Texas Rangers and other local law enforcement officials would move a prisoner at midnight for their safety to go to the county jail in Brownsville. However, on the way from San Benito to Brownsville, they were lynched or killed or whatever. Uh, and it became very common knowledge that if you're a prisoner in San Benito in 1915 during this time, and you were going to be removed from that jail cell at night, you were going to be killed. And you're in the hands of law enforcement and vigilantes. So that was the first Matanza. And by the way, that was the, that was the marker. You know, that was the first marker. That was the marker we all thought would get rejected. It was not. So we were surprised. We were happy that it got accepted. So it's there today. You can go visit it. If you're going to go to the beach, you know, you go off San Benito. As soon as you're leaving San Benito, there's a, a rest stop that you can stop at where the marker's at. Uh, Jovita Idad. Jovita Idad uh, came from a prominent uh, progressive family out of Laredo, Texas. Uh, they wrote, uh, they had an, an own newspapers. They were reporters and educators like Idad was. Uh, the reason we highlighted Idad was because she wrote editorials against the Rangers while they were doing these killings. The Rangers went to her newspaper and were going to shut down the newspaper, but she stood in front of the door to not allow them in fully knowing that the Rangers had already killed several hundred Mexicans in a short span of time. So this was somebody who was very brave speaking up for the defense of those individuals who were being killed by the Rangers and other law enforcement at this time. 
Uh, they came, the Rangers did come back later when she was not there to destroy her printing press and her newspaper. So we had, a, there's a historical marker in Laredo, downtown Laredo that you can go see that's devoted to Jovita Edad. The Porvenir massacre, uh, and like I said, I just set up an article link uh, that's related to a news feature that just came out today about this massacre. Uh, the Porvenir massacre, uh, where 15 individuals were pulled from their community and killed by Texas Rangers, U.S. Army, and local ranchers, uh, was the catalyst to the Ranger investigation. And so this happened in uh, January of 1918. The Rangers were later then investigated in uh, February, I mean, January of 2018, I mean, excuse me, 1918, the Rangers were later investigated in, in February of uh, 20, uh, excuse me, uh, 1919. I'm getting my years mixed up here, I'm sorry. Uh, and so this massacre was important because the survivors, the women and the children, who fled Porvenir across the border to Mexico, uh, found the protection of the Mexican army there, and the Mexican government then demanded an investigation to what occurred. Uh, in this case, something did occur to the Rangers. They were fired, but they were never charged with uh, any murder or attempted murder. In fact, the captain of the Ranger company uh, who was fired complained that why are, they, why are people upset? They're just Mexicans who were killed. And this isn't a written document, by the way. So these aren't things I'm putting into his mouth or saying he didn't say. These are all documented uh, statements that we're talking about, that I'm talking about. And then the Bazan Longoria historical marker. That's uh, over there in San Manuel. Uh, it's right across from the Chorizo factory of San Manuel. There's a little park there. Uh, Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria uh, were ranchers. Uh, Antonio Longoria was a former county commissioner. And uh, they went to uh, tell the rangers that some individuals had taken their horses. These individuals were insurgents. And I'll talk about the insurgency in a minute. Uh, the rangers accused them of helping the insurgency uh, and killed them, uh, shot them in the back while they were on horseback. Uh, they're buried over there in San Manuel, and the marker is there to remember them. So even if you're a prominent political fig figure, if you were Mexicano, it didn't matter your public office did not protect you, okay? So this is how uh, the impunity of the state of Texas occurred at this time. And by impunity, I mean uh, the state has never been held accountable, even to this day, of the killings of these individuals that occurred. With all these historical markers, we also had public programming. Uh, we had educational programming that was sometimes began a week before the marker unveiling. Uh, so people who could not go to the marker unveiling could learn about this history. Then the day of the market in Valley would have a, a day conference, either at UT Brownsville, I mean UTRGB Brownsville, or UTRGB in Annenberg, depending if we're talking about the Matanza marker in, in, in Cameron County, or the Bazan Logoria marker in Hidalgo County. The Porvini massacre uh, was the first marker where people objected to the mark to the marker because they wanted language that stated that the individuals who were killed were bandits. We fought against that. It took over a month for us to have them reject that proposed new language, which delayed the original date of the marker unveiling. Uh, but we're able to do it through a, a national effort to bring pressure on the state of Texas and the State Historical Society to not change the text in that manner. Uh, and the marker ended up going up, but we weren't able to provide the educational programming original, originally scheduled. Uh, the original scheduled date for the marker unveiling did allow descendants of the members who were killed at least to come and meet uh, and to discuss and remember their family members or the ancestors who were killed. The same thing occurred for the Bazan Logoria uh, marker unveiling, where many of the members or descendants of the Bazan Logorias uh, who live here in, in Edinburgh, McAllen, and Mission, this area, were able to attend that marker unveiling as well. So we provided public programming. Again, the idea was to increase the knowledge of these events and also, and most importantly, at the Porvenir, I mean, excuse me, at the Matanza. And the Bazan Logoria markers, uh, we also had a blessing. Uh, we, we did that because we needed to uh, remember the individuals who were killed in a, in a ceremony because many times individuals were killed were just left in the monte, or the woods, as you would, and their bodies were never recovered. So we wanted this also to be a sacred moment of remembrance for those who were killed who were denied uh, the sacrament uh, of their last rites and of their burial. With the burial with the funeral to occur in the church and so on. 
Uh, and so we also gain some publicity about all these activities. So the Bob Bullock uh, Museum exhibit, mm -hmm. Life and Death on the Border, 1910 and 1920. Uh, if you search that, you can actually find the exhibit with some of the photos and educational materials attached to it. Uh, we want to make sure that the story was told about a community with deep roots. Uh, a lot of people, including my students, don't know how long uh, first the indigenous communities were here before the Europeans came along, and then not how long the Spanish then came along, right? Uh, the settlements of Reynosa, Matamoros, Laredo, and the ranches on both sides of the river are older than the United States as a nation. So there's a community with very deep roots that lived in this area and that had land. Uh, we also want to talk about how the community was transformed with the coming of the railroad and how that changed economic relationships between uh, those who were new to the area, what some historians call newcomers, who were predominantly farmers, uh, versus the old timers, the old white ranching families, right? So previous to the 20th century and the railroad, you're going to have interracial marriages between white individuals and Mexicanos uh, or business relationships or political relationships that occurred there. In fact, Jovita Gonzalez from Star County, who is a historian in this time period, in the early 20th century, talks about the Mexicanization of white individuals, the idea that, uh, that they didn't speak English, uh, they became Catholic, and they become very much entwined in the community, right? Uh, so if you ever come across individuals who are, quote, not Mexican, but are much more Mexicano than a Mexicano, this is, this is a long history to that process. Then we want to talk about uh, during that transformation of uh, going from predominantly ranching to farming in Cameron, Willacy, and, and Hidalgo County, how the community then started to deal with issues of increased racial discrimination. So all the newcomer cities, McAllen, Harlingen, uh, San Benito, uh, mission, they were all segregated, right? And depending on the city, the segregation occurred either north to south or east to west, right? So for instance, in Westaco, uh, on the north side of the railroad, it was the Mexican side. In McAllen, it was the south side, right? Uh, San Benito, you have east and west San Benito. So depending on what community you're looking at, you're going to see segregated communities. Edinburgh was the same way, east and west. <coughs> so you can start to see segregation in uh, living arrangements and these new cities that started in the early 20th century as a result of the railroad, as well as segregation within schools. So educational opportunities are being attacked or undermined by uh, these segregation efforts. Because as far as uh, people who control the school districts now, Mexicanos were really about labor. And they, do not need it. they did not need to be educated. And then the other thing we want to talk about within this history of the Bob Bullock Museum that we explained to them when we first met with them to talk about the idea of this exhibit, was that despite this horrific history, this is a community of resilience. The Valley today, uh, and has for a long time, produces the largest number of Latino PhDs, medical doctors and attorneys in the nation. The other area that does the same amount of production or creation of, uh, of individuals who are Latino who are getting advanced degrees is the state of New Mexico. And mainly it's because of the demographics of those communities where Mexicanos who eventually retake power are not going to engage in those discriminatory acts against their children. In fact, two years ago, eighth grade Latinas from the Valley uh, surpassed the state average in STEM testing for the state of Texas. So if you want to look for future engineers and scientists and mathematicians, look to Mexicana girls in the Valley uh, who are going through high school at this point in time uh, for the future. But this is a story that does not get told in the popular media, right? This is a story, the border story is always told as one of those violent Mexicans who are living there and that violent community and it's dangerous and it needs to be heavily policed. We, we see it develop uh, in the late 19th century, this trope, and that trope still exists with us today. So here's a image for the Bullock Museum, for the exhibit. This is, uh, this is the, when you walk into this exhibit, this was one of the first things you're gonna see. Uh, and what we had here in the exhibit was a wedding dress for an individual during the early 20th century. She ordered her wedding dress from Paris, right? So it talks about sort of the economic wealth of some members. Here's a photo image of Brownsville, uh, Elizabeth Street, and this is where some soldiers who were, who were brought down during 1915 came. And I'll talk about that in a minute for why that occurred. When the railroad comes in, the railroad's going to 
dramatically change the economic dynamics of the lower Rio Grande Valley. Uh, what the railroad's going to do is going to allow for now the production of farm produce to be shipped easily and readily through rail to markets north of the valley, right? So this is going to be the beginning in the 19-teens and the 1920s of the agricultural boom that we'll see develop here. This is going to attract immigrants both from the north and also from Mexico as labor opportunities became available. But those individuals coming in from the north do not see or understand why Mexican or Mexican-Americans would own land or be in positions of political power or be wealthy. Right? And so there's going to be some conflicts that emerge here. Uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, 50% of Hidalgo County is still land owned by Mexicanos. That is a decline of 50% ownership from the 19th century. But it was also a significant amount of land that was still owned by Mexicanos, right? So some historians looked at it as a decline, which it is, but other historians who understand the perceptions at this time period, uh, the large land ownership percentage of the community was seen as problematic and wrong and a threat uh, by individuals coming into this area. Okay, there we go. Oops. It jumped one up. Okay. So during this time period, uh, by 1915, uh, several individuals were upset with the mistreatment of Mexicanos. Now, over 70% of the community was literate. So by 1910, you have newspapers. Uh, over 30 newspapers and magazines being published in Spanish in the Rio Grande Valley. So the community is literate. Uh, uh, the community has a significant number of schools that are outside the county system, that are private schools that they use to educate their children. Some are, are religious schools, some are just secular private schools, and then some are ranch schools. But the value of education was very important. And it goes back uh, to the history of this community. Back in the 1790s in Matamoros, uh, you had free public education for children in the city of Matamoros. In Laredo, at the same time, you had compulsory education, which meant that if a child did not go to school, that's a, that's a school age, the parents could be uh, uh, arrested or, or fined for their child not going to school. So when the United States was just beginning, beginning as a nation, this community had embraced public education and compulsory education for the children. So it shouldn't be surprised that uh, by, uh, by, by the tens, that 70 or, or close to 80% of the community is literate. They can read and they can write, uh, and, and they're not ignorant, regardless if they are some guy who owns you know, 20 acres or somebody who owns 1,000 acres. Uh, education is an important part of the Mexicano community's cultural worldview. And so these individuals who were educated understood a political philosophy called liberalism. And liberalism is the idea that you all learn when you learn about the Declaration of Independence, right? The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and, and Mexicanos in this area embrace that political idea. It's not a uniquely U.S. idea. Uh, the idea expressed in the Declaration of Independence was several, uh, it was over 100 something years old or, or, or longer based on other European philosophers' understanding of individual rights and the development of what we call individual and later on human rights. Well, many kind of embraced and learned about those ideas as well. Particularly the idea of the pursuit of happiness, which is really about the pursuit of property. Uh, Mexicanos who owned property were very much entrepreneurs and liked to make money. So they were capitalists as well, right? They weren't communists. Uh, and so the problem that we get in the early 20th centuries is the racist view that Mexicanos should not be anything other than laborers. And that was a problem because many were not just simply laborers. We're living down here. And so what's going to happen is that as law enforcement becomes involved in the killing of people uh, under their, their custody, where you start to see individuals being pushed from their land during the Canales hearing, you do have an individual who was uh, who admitted to taking Texas Rangers to landowners to say, if you don't sign over your land to me or sell it to me, you just guys can come back and get you. Right. So we're going to we're going to have examples of that. We also have examples of people who refused to sign over the land who were killed by the Rangers and then their land gets sold by the widow. Right. Not all widows sold the land, by the way. Like, for instance, in the case of Bazana Longoria, 
Miss Longoria held on to her land, despite the clear threat that was uh, aimed at the rest of her children. <coughs> and so we have a community under siege. And what this picture is from the Robert Ryan collection is of a bridge between uh, Brownsville and going into Matamoros, where families are leaving their lands to seek safety on the Mexican side of the river because of US law enforcement, in this case, the Texas Rangers, some local law enforcement officials, uh, and the US Army, because they did not feel safe to continue living on their lands. And if they didn't go to Mexico, like my great grandmother, when my great grandfather was killed, Paulino Cerda and his father, uh, she fled uh, Laguna Seca Ranch and came to the city of Vandenberg with my grandmother, who was a year and about three months old at the time, on a buckboard. My, grand, my, my great-grandmother was a businesswoman. She owned a little store. She had dairy cattle, and she had other sorts of business activities. But uh, the rangers came for, for her husband, and they killed her father-in-law as well because of, you know, supposedly alleged to be abandoned. And that wasn't the case. And so this is what's going on here. So people will do will rise up. There's an insurgency called the Plan de San Diego by some. Uh, the Mexicanos will call it the Mexican, uh, Mexicano Tejano Revolt. Uh, and they were very clear on why they were revolting. They were revolting, one, because the Rangers were indiscriminately killing individuals for no reason other than obviously they wanted their land. Two, land was being taken away. And three, other economic opportunities and discrimination was occurring. Uh, economic opportunities were denied to them and other discrimination was occurring. We know this because they actually write it out. These weren't ignorant folks. These were individuals who were property owners who got fed up and decided to take up arms in defense of their property, right? This is the same story we hear with the American Revolution, where individuals want to protect their lives against the state and they want to protect the property. This is what happened here in 1915. But it also became an opportunity to label anybody an insurrectionist, i.e. a bandit, to kill them so that the land could be taken away. And so this is history that we continue to uncover and bring forward that a lot of people were not aware of. Because the way the story was told before us, oh, those are bandits. This is uh, a, a painting by uh, Godman uh, Lomas Garza. Uh, she's a famous painter out of Kingsville. Uh, her work has been published in books and things like that. We have a collection, by the way, at STC. I think we have a permanent exhibit of some of her work. Uh, and I like this image because it's an image of resilience. It's about the family and doing the everyday, everyday things that a community needs to do to survive. Uh, and so I like this image, and it was an image that I believe we used in the Bullock Museum that talks about this. So the story is also about how we were resilient. Uh, how the community survived, how my great-grandmother uh, continued to live without my great-grandfather being around, uh, and how my grandmother was raised in that way. My oldest uncle from my grandmother is named Paulino, and named, named after her father, who was killed by the Rangers. Uh, so we're also at community resilience. Despite all these sorts of things that occurred against the community, uh, we have continued, and we've, we have many ways thrived that doesn't get recognized. So I, I talked about the state already uh, and the revolt. Uh, this is Benjamin Johnson, one of the members of Refusing to Forget. Uh, this is his book called Revolution in Texas. Uh, and the link is there for you to check out if you want to check out the book. Uh, but I'm showing you this book because I want to go to a quote uh, that he, he utilizes in his work to talk about the state's involvement. So he writes in pages 120, 124, this is page 123. Uh, he talks about how the, the Rangers, uh, Ransom, uh, would go out and quote, this is Ransom's report. Now, this is a report to the governor of Texas. You got you to understand that the Rangers were so blatant in what they're doing, uh, and they thought it was so okay that they will say things openly like, oh, I killed this Mexican or I did this or did that, without worrying about being charged with murder. So this is where he talks about the removal of communities uh, from their lands. Uh, and I'll talk about Ransom in particular in a minute. I drove all the Mexicans from the uh, three ranches, uh, Rancho uh, Leon, Nueva, and Viejo. Uh, and then Johnson goes on to say, such removals could be profitable as the general exodus of Mexican is furnishing a field for rich profits for persons desiring to buy cheaply the property of these refugees. 
according to another newspaper. This is from a newspaper account, right? So the newspaper, the English press was very much aware of people leaving their lands and that the property is now available for purchase. The persons removing the individuals from those lands were the rangers. Uh, and so this was occurring in 1915. Okay? This was what's going on. The state was very much aware of this because the rangers are reporting back to the governor and uh, the adjutant general who's in charge of the rangers what they're doing because they have to file daily reports. It's in the daily reports about what was occurring. And nobody thought it was wrong. Uh, well, I should say for the most part, many people did not think it was wrong uh, at the state of Texas level and for other landowners who wanted this land. Okay. Let me give you a, a Brownsville Herald article. Uh, August 9th, 1915. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but he's talking about a new solution the Rangers are going to utilize in dealing with, quote, the bandit problem. Right? It is not unlikely that the certain instructions order them to shoot to disable suspicious characters on site, i.e. shoot first, kill, and don't worry about it. And this is what happened. And the newspapers were aware of this. Uh, and uh, I'm going to end my presentation with um, this is a list. You can't really see it very well uh, on the screen uh, here. Uh, but if you go to Refusing to Forget, we have the list there. Uh, we have the list of 100 something uh, names with dates and locations of when they were killed. Uh, and you can see their names there. This is the continuation of the list. Okay. Um, this, the list of names that was created, which was called the death list, was created by Franklin Pearson, who was a U.S. consul in Matamoros, who uh, kept track of the individuals who were killed uh, as the reports came in. Uh, the United States government asked for this list. And uh, this list was then provided to the U.S. government. And the comment from the general, the Army general that was here in Brownsville about this list is that this list was probably not complete and that there were probably at least 300 people killed. The time period we're looking at the 300 people being killed is from July of 1915 to November, I mean, excuse me, October of 1915. Uh, with the population size at this time, the number of people killed, or to use the word that was common at the time, evaporated. And that was a term that people would use when a Mexican was killed. They got evaporated. Was a greater, a greater percentage of the population than the dirty wars in Argentina uh, during the late 70s. That was over several years. So this is a history of a dirty war, of a war to ethnically cleanse the land of ownership by Mexicanos uh, that scholars had known about. I've known about growing up with this history, but that the general public either was not aware of for the most part. And we tried changing that. And more importantly, we tried changing how we should understand the victims of this killings. One of the interesting things about today's report from El Paso uh, that I sent the link up on the chat the Department of Public Safety, where the Texas Rangers are now housed, when contacted about the Puerto Venite massacre, clearly stated that the today's Texas Rangers have no relationship to the former Texas Rangers. This is the first time any of us at Refusing to Forget have heard the Department of Public Safety actually distance themselves from the, uh, the original set of Rangers that were part of the state of Texas before they became part of DPS. Hopefully, that's a changing sign where the state of Texas will start to recognize and accept responsibility for these past acts. One last slide. Questions? Uh, what I'm providing you here is a book. I probably should have looked it up the link for you, but it's called With This Pistol in His Hand. Uh, Américo Paredes is the author of this book. Américo Paredes is from Brownsville, Texas. Uh, he helped start the Center for Mesmeric Studies at UT Austin. This book came out in 57. And it's a direct response to a previous book called The Texas Rangers, A Century of, uh, a Century of Frontier Defense by Walter Prescott Webb, where Walter Prescott Webb, a prominent historian at the University of Texas, where a medical bias is, was at when he published this book as well, um, referred to Mexicans on the border as uh, uh, having ditch water uh, blood, and they weren't truly noble like the Apaches or Comanches. Uh, perception back then was Mexicanos are indigenous but they're not pure indigenous or noble indigenous. They are, quote, uh, filled with ditch water, right? And a medical pilot uh, pushes back against this notion, and he's the first one to publish a book at the collegiate level 
that showed ranger atrocities occurring. In fact, he describes the, the killing of the Flores men uh, outside of Brownsville, uh, where he interviewed uh, the, the, the sister, who was the daughter and the sister of the individuals that were killed in front of her at her home. Uh, so this is one of the first books to actually push back uh, uh, against the idea that the individuals killed were bandits. With that, uh, I'm uh, free to take questions. So we have in the chat box, excuse me if I'm correct, but didn't the U.S. government justify these killings by the revolt of Pancho Villa? Uh, no, uh, Pancho Villa's raid occurs in 20, uh, 1916, not 1915. Uh, and it created in Columbus, New Mexico. Uh, but you're right in that the, the Columbus raid by Pancho Villa furthers the idea that the border is a dangerous area and that all Mexicans should be uh, uh, not given the same sort of due process and respect that all Americans deserve. And by the way, Pancho Villa was never in the Lower Rogan Valley or this area of, of, of the world. Uh, there were Villistas here. But Pancho Villa himself never came down to Reynosa or Montemoros or those areas. Yeah, any other students have questions, please? Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, uh, concerning uh, political representation, the lone uh, Mexican American uh, representative was JT Canales out of Brownsville, Texas. And he's the one that pushes forward the investigation of the Rangers. Uh, and the reason he's able to do that is because of the Puerto Vene massacre uh, being an international incident where the United States government uh, told the, the governor of Texas that something needed to be done concerning those rangers. Uh, and, and that sort of political pressure brought about the investigation of the rangers as well. What kind of pushback did he have in the state assembly when he was bringing up these investigations? Well, before the state assembly and, and before he was able to put forward that legis uh, legislation, uh, Frank Hamer, uh, who is a ranger who gets uh, celebrated, uh, The Highwaymen and Netflix is a, a movie about him. He's most famously known for killing Bonnie and Clyde. Actually, uh, told Canales that he was going to kill him. Uh, Canales went to the sheriff, Sheriff Van. By the way, Sheriff Van out of Cameron County never allowed any of his prisoners when he arrested somebody to be turned over to the rangers because he knew what would happen to the prisoners. So Sheriff Van was actually somebody who protected his prisoners, and many of them were released because they were found to have not been bandits. But he knew that if he allowed them to be with the Rangers, they'd be killed. But anyway, Canales uh, and Frank Hammer went in front of Sheriff Van, and, and Frank uh, and Canales told uh, uh, Hammer to say what he said to him. And Hammer told the sh in front of the sheriff, says, yeah, I want to kill him if he keeps trying to meddle with the Texas Rangers. Uh, so what happened is when the investigation was going on in the state in Austin, uh, other state representatives, including, you know, there were allies who were white, right? Not everybody here who was upset the Rangers was just Mexican or Mexican-American, uh, would walk around them so that he could not be shot, including Lyndon Johnson's father, Senator Johnson, was one of the people who, was, who would physically put their body to protect them so he wouldn't get killed in Austin. Hmm. Uh, okay, thank you. One more question. What is the primary objective for your organization if Texas does indeed take responsibility? Uh, well, the state of Texas takes responsibility uh, for what occurred there. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know we have uh, an objective at this point other than uh, we believe a state apology should occur to the individuals and there should be some correction there. Uh, there's a restorative justice project related to the state sanctioned killing of African Americans uh, that is occurring right now uh, and they're exploring uh, possible reparations not understand not sure what the reparations would be like uh like the sort of physical payments for the descendants of those individuals killed but uh that's one possibility they're looking at we haven't engaged in those conversations at this point the, the only conversation we have really right now uh is concerning the texas state ranger museum and hall of fame or the hall of fame and ranger museum uh and it's continued uh uh, inaccurate depiction of this history. So one of the objectives we do have is to have the Ranger Museum correct its exhibits and follow scholarly standards for presentation of this history. And then the other one is we would like, obviously, an apology from the state of Texas about what occurred at this point. Um, is there any evidence to just if the Richard King families were involved in these acts of a company? When Canales brought forward uh, the charges that led to the investigation by the state of Texas, uh, Caesar Clayburgh uh, was one of the leaders in providing the defense for the Texas Rangers and others. Uh, there's a story 
uh, and this was relayed by represent the current representative of Canales, uh, where the reason the Canaleses were able to hold on to their ranch, which is right next to the King Ranch, was because of a general who, a Mexican general who offered them military protection against the Kings uh, and the Kennedys. Uh, that general was named Juan Cortina. Now, if you don't know Valley history, Juan Cortina led one of the first rebellions against the United States government in 1859. Uh, it became a very strong uh, military force on both sides of the border. He was born on this side. Um, eventually, uh, he will go under house arrest under Porfirio Diaz. But uh, the kings feared Cortina because he had the ability to muster a strong enough force that would have been damaging to their ranch operations. And so the Canales and La Cabra Ranch, uh, La Cabra Ranch is right next to the King Ranch, uh, the family was able to maintain their property in this way. Uh, not everybody had a general or some sort of strong military figure that could help them protect their lands in this case. Uh, and this is related, this is specific to the kings. And this is a, a, a history laid by the current representative of Canales out of Edinburgh. Um, just want to get some clarification, uh, Trini. The, no ranger or vigilante was ever prosecuted for any of these extra legal killings? No. In fact, the, the rangers who were part of the Porvenin massacre, uh, Fox, who was the individual who was removed uh, from his position, will eventually come back to be a ranger. Uh, many of them went on to join the Border Patrol hmm. or law enforcement. So they, they continue to work as, in law enforcement activities, but none of them suffered any sort of criminal charges. Um, you had mentioned that one marker was rejected. I'm just curious, just what is the process for markers either being approved or rejected? Is, is that something the state assembly looks at? Um, no, uh, the, there's a program called the Under Toll Historical Marker. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody can apply for that marker. Uh, there's a process where you got to provide the research, uh, the bibliography, and, and the other materials that they ask for to support the, the creation of that marker. Uh, and that's what we use. We use the undertow marker series to do that. The other way to do it is for a county historical commission to submit the application for a historical marker. However, the county historical commission, depending on the policies of that county, uh, may or may not support uh, a, marker a marker application that you would want. So, for instance, I, I forgot to talk about this, but uh, Antonio Rodriguez was lynched in uh, 1910 in Rock Springs, Rockport, uh, Texas, excuse me. And uh, his lynching actually was the impetus for the first state civil rights meeting of Mexicanos in Texas at the El Primer Congreso Mexicanista in Laredo in 1911, the following year. We want to get a marker for him uh, to com commemorate uh, uh, his lynching and to, to talk about the importance of that lynching as being a catalyst for the development of civil rights, at least organizing across the state. Uh, the county commissioner, the county political figures and the county historical commissioners told the state of Texas that that marker would not stand if they put it there. I.e., as soon as it got set up, it, it would be taken down. Uh, and the state of Texas doesn't want to spend several thousand dollars in a historical marker where the local community is just going to tear it down. So that marker was never uh, set up. So we have to deal with the politics of local communities uh, resisting to have this history told. That's just out of sight that, that there would be people there that would do that? Oh, you no, know, they, they openly told the, the State Historical Commission that the marker would not stand. <laughs> Yeah. Just like the fight we had with Port Vini, but the, with the with the uh, and and for that marker, but we're we're able to muster enough political support to have the marker placed without the text being changed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question here: Did Mexico attempt to protect their native-born citizens suffering at the hands of the Rangers? Uh, by the 1920s, after the revolutionary government uh, settles in to some sort of stability, uh, the Mexican consuls, if the individual was a Mexican citizen. Uh, and was killed by law enforcement, the Mexican government would provide counsel to seek uh, 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 some sort of uh, compensation for the families who were victims of that killing. Uh, there was a famous uh, massacre in Raymondville, Texas, uh, during the mid-1920s, where seven individuals uh, 
four of the, the seven individuals were Mexican citizens, so they had Mexican consul uh, 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 advocating for their families. The other individuals were not, uh, were, excuse me, U.S. citizens, so therefore the Mexican government did not provide them counsel. This is going to be one of the reasons why you're going to have the development of the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, because the feeling was that uh, Mexican Americans or individuals who were U.S. who were U.S. citizens did not have the protection of the Mexican government, and therefore needed to create their own legal uh, support networks through a civil rights organization to protect them uh, in Texas and in the rest of the United States. And that's how the League of United Latin American Citizens was developed. By the way, uh, the vast majority of the founding members are World War One veterans. So when you look at Mex the history of Mexican American civil rights in the United States, uh, they emanated from. Uh, uh, military veterans who fought in World War One and World War Two, and that would make sense. I mean, if you're out there fighting for a war with, you know, the the, the pretentious rhetoric of we're fighting for liberty and democracy, mm -hmm. and you come back and you have to face the rabid white supremacy, I, I could see someone being very motivated to push back against that in every way. Yeah. Um, you you had mentioned the rhetoric at the time as Mexicans as were innately dangerous. Um, yes. And so I, I, Go ahead. Go ahead and finish your question and I'll answer. Yeah, and I was just thinking about the rhetoric that's been happening in recent times of, I mean, there was a textbook recently that was proposed by this, the, the State Board of Education indicating that me Mexicans were um, were conducive to labor uh, or were, were lazy. Um, yeah. And then the, just the anti-immigration. And I'm just thinking, too, that uh, a lot of this coincided with the Me Mexican Revolution in 1915. And so you mm -hmm. did have a lot of people immigrating to this. So I imagine um, there was a lot of white supremacist host hostility towards these people. Um, and we could probably certainly see, see uh, parallels to that today. Uh, right. With, coming from Central America and Mexico um, of people trying to escape the instability uh, of some of those countries currently. Yeah. The, the, the anti-Mexican uh, rhetoric uh, finds its roots in the, the black legend from the English of the Spanish, right? Uh, and it continued on into the 19th century. There's a really good book by Arnaldo de Leon called They Call Them Greasers. Mm -hmm. uh, about this racist stereotype from the 19th century, right? So what we're talking about in today's language, the racist stereotype, particularly the dangerous border and dangerous Mexican, uh, that's rhetoric that's over 220 years old or 200 years old, right? Uh, so what we're hearing today, you know, when Donald Trump said they're rapists and they're worse and all that, that's not new, it's old. Uh, and that goes back to the 19th century. Uh, the history and the telling of, Met of Texas has always been one of the Mexicans as the bad people and evil and, and the Anglo as a good uh, person who embraces liberty and freedom and all that. So those tropes uh, are old and embedded, uh, and they were just utilized uh, uh, at those times, right? Um, so that's not surprising. I mean, as a historian, I know the historical roots of those racist tropes. Concerning the textbook, uh, the idea that the Mexican was lazy and all that, uh, that was in those that proposed textbook. Uh, fortunately, we were able to have it rejected. Uh, but again, the, the, you have multiple stereotypes about, uh, particularly Mexicans on the border. Right? I mean, um, you know, uh, it, it's not uncommon to hear other people outside the valley say, "Is it safe to go to the valley? <laughs> is it safe to visit?" Uh, of course, it is. Uh, but uh, that is the predominant perception still today of the border, right? That, now, that it's that, that's unsafe. Funny, um I, I, when I first moved here, I, you know, and there were uh, shootings in Reynosa, you know, would make the national news and my mother would call me and, you know, is everything okay over there? <laughs> and she almost had this understanding that, uh, I, you know, I had to open up my door to make sure bullets weren't flying, you know, slowly. <laughs> um, uh, there's another question here uh, about uh, African yeah. uniform were murdered, uh, were Mexican Americans in uniform murdered. I know Mexican American veterans have been uh, uh, beaten. Uh, I, I can't say right off the hand of they were in uniform and they got they were lynched. Uh, so that I'm not aware of. But certainly Mexican American veterans have been beaten and abused by law enforcement officers, uh, and it goes back to World War One veterans to the rest of the 20th century. Mm. 
Uh, it, Fox makes it sound like we're war zone down here. I, I know. Uh, uh, that's a misrepresentation of the border. It's not in a, a new way of representing the border nationally. Uh, that's a, that's an older, like I said, that's a trope that goes back to the 19th century. And by trope, that means the stereotype. Uh, yeah. It's a utilization to justify uh, a heavy military or police presence in the community. Yes. A that, yeah. that you don't get another that, For instance, the way you don't get with the U.S. Canadian border. Yeah, and, and indeed, this place is heavily policed. I've, I've never lived in a community as policed as, as this community is. Um, you know, the other thing I was saying, to, to thinking about the, this this rhetoric too, is uh, obviously it has consequences. But the, the the consequence most recently that is most disturbing is the El Paso shooter in, in Walmart a few years back, and mm -hmm. one could just dismiss his rhetoric as just the rantings of a crazy person, but. If, if you read his manifesto carefully, I think it's like a four-page manifesto. It's 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 littered with all of these tropes uh, that you're referring to, uh, right. and the, manic invasion and all of this kind of um, stuff. And, and, and the link I, I submitted about the CNN piece where where I come out as well. One of the things I'm asked about is uh, are things changed? And I said, yeah, things changed. Obviously, law enforcement officers aren't arbitrarily pulling people out of prisons and just executing them. We're going to the homes and executing them down here in the border, right? But what I said has not changed was the rhetoric, the tropes. Uh, and I said that this language is dangerous because in order to get to an action like the arbitrarily killing of Mexicanos, you have to have the ideas that say that it's okay, right? Ideas are important. Language is important because it relays the ideas that say this is the way the world should be. Uh, a month after that CNN piece aired, we did have the El Paso, El, El Paso mer uh, massacre. So I was re-interviewed uh, uh, along with Melva, uh, you know, where the reporter says, you literally said that this could be dangerous and that this, like, this could happen. And it literally happened a month after that interview was aired, right? Uh, and so they followed up with us. Uh, and I was also interviewed by NPR about the El Paso massacre and, and, and talking about the history of the racist tropes. And that is the problem, right? When you have and justify uh, these racist ideas, it allows you to dehumanize other people, and therefore it's okay to physically hurt them or harm them in some way. And that's that's what's most dangerous. The ideas and the language used to support those ideas is very dangerous. Got another question from Tom there. Um, would you achieve the root Yeah, I mean, definitely. If you talk about the the, the War of eighteen forty six, definitely. Uh, you know, and before that, the Alamo, uh, the idea that the the Mexican is dangerous uh, is it goes back to those roots, right? So, uh, in fact, when the state of Texas had this investigation and they produced their report, one of the things that uh, Representative Canales was trying to achieve was to have Texas Rangers bonded. Uh, all law enforcement in the state of Texas have to have a bond, which means that if they do something wrong to somebody, that bond could offset the, or provide the compensation for the individual who's wronged. The Rangers were not bonded at this time. And Canales was saying they need to be bonded because if you're bonded, then you have to find somebody who actually trusts you enough with that bond so that you don't have to pay the money on that bond. And so uh, Canales saw this as a common sense reform to rein in abuses by the Rangers. Well, that report was produced by the committee talking about how to reform the Rangers. What they stated was that the Rangers should not be bonded because of the dangerous Mexicans on the border, right? So even though they hear all of this testimony about the abuses of the Rangers, their response was, oh, that's just a few bad animals. That was a bad governor. This is not systemic. Uh, we're going to fix uh, the hiring of quality Rangers. With, that's how we're going to fix it. But we shouldn't bond them, right? We shouldn't create a system that's going to force the Rangers to act appropriately like the rest of law enforcement officers in the state of Texas should act. Uh, and so, you know, the other trope or the other defense of abuse by law enforcement is that it's a few bad apples is over 100 years as well. Uh, so we hear that today as an excuse not to deal with systemic reforms within law enforcement. But the argument is it's just a few bad apples. Well, the, the, the few bad apples argument is, is, is old and it has not changed anything as far as trying to hire good apples, I guess. Uh, uh, and, and so, yes, the racism goes back to the Alamo and to that time period, you know. 
the idea that uh, Mexicans are, are somehow a racial intermixture of different races and therefore they're not pure and white. Uh, Gabriella has a question. Uh, right. uh, I, I think well, certainly, uh, particularly those markers are provided uh, programming around them and continuously referring to them so people could go and learn that history. But markers are, are, are just one step in that direction. We really need to have curriculum uh, developed uh, and utilized at the K-12 level uh, to talk about one, that race is an idea. Race is not biological, folks. It's an idea that humans have developed a few hundred years ago. Before that, we didn't think about race as a dividing mechanism between human beings. Uh, and that racism is an ideology built from the concept of race. Once we dismantle the idea of race, we can then grapple with the issues of racism. Uh, and so hopefully we get to a world where we can actually dismantle that. That being said, I'm not saying that race and the experience of, of racism did not exist or does not exist today. What I'm saying is that those ideas are very powerful and have shaped our world over the last 200 years, but they are ideas that we should be able to grapple with to hopefully undo so we can move to a better world. And so historical markers are, are one component of trying to get to that better world. Uh, curriculum development, documentaries, uh, changing the museum related to the Rangers and Waco, uh, and, and having the state finally acknowledge that this was wrong, uh, that this should not have occurred. Yeah, I I, th I see what you, what um, what you're doing, Trini, as a historian, is you are helping to change the narrative too. As often as you've mentioned w how this has been traditionally referred to um, in the 19 teens uh, to justify it and to explain it as these were the bandit wars. Yeah, but they called yeah the bandit wars of the bandit era. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, yeah, we're, we're changing the narrative around that. So that's, that's why we were all surprised when we saw the uh, Department of Public Safety statement distancing themselves from these rangers, which had never occurred before. Because you go to the website, they find their roots in these rangers. And maybe they're going to, maybe they've changed the website. We haven't found, I, have, I need to go look to see if the website has been changed with the history of the rangers on it. Because this is the first time I hear the Department of Public Safety distance themselves from these rangers, quote unquote. So that's I think, yeah, I think textbooks truly explain history uh, the way it should and maintain neutrality when explaining historical events, it would help. Well, that's an interesting term, Gabriella, neutrality. Um, um, I, I think it gets kind of to the root of, of probably the, the problem with dangerous narratives, because I, I would imagine that anybody spinning a, a narrative that's dangerous to a certain population would view their narrative as being neutral. Um, I think one of the things that we need to recognize is history is inherently political. Um, yeah, the, the things I tell students at the very beginning of the semester is that the history textbooks are a particular uh, interpretation of the past. They're not the only interpretation of the same past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Um, so whatever yeah. Necessary to are simply an interpretation of the past. They are not the mere representation of the facts of the past. Yeah. They're an interpretation. Hmm? Go ahead. I, I lost you. I lost you there. So. Oh, I was just thinking about the, um, just different viewpoints. My, uh, my internet's going out. I'm, I'm sorry, Sean. Uh, my internet stops. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I got you. You're coming in clear now. You, you, there was a little okay. bit of there. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I explained to students that textbooks are, are interpretive uh, understandings of the past are not the simple facts of the past. Yeah, and um, hearkening back to that Zen quote that I shared earlier, I think a lot of traditional history textbooks, and there's still an effort um, previous to that, to that quote when he's talking about, I don't want to talk about the history of states or the history of governments. He was bringing up Henry Kissinger, um, who literally wrote a book called The Memory of States. Um, and so I think that has been in large part of this kind of top-down narrative of, if you understand the history, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, you know, the political makers of any given uh, time period, uh, you'll, you'll have a, a firm understanding of the historical record. And I think 
you know, in the last at least two to three generations, that has been slowly changing uh, to, to be more inclusive and to uh, try to look at the history of states as, as just one measurement or, or, or way of, of analyzing history and understanding history. Did my camera lock up? No, no. Okay, so my screen is like, I just, my image is frozen there on my screen for some reason. Okay. Okay. Any uh, other questions or comments from students? There have been some great questions, so if, if there's anything else, I would definitely like to hear from students. Uh, my, I was going to put something, I was going to put my email in the chat, but it, my, for some reason it's not working. Okay. I'll, uh, uh, could, yeah, if you, could put my, if you could put my email in the chat, uh, somebody yeah. wants to with some questions or want me to direct them to more resources, uh, feel free to email me. And then I'll, I'm sharing the, a document that uh, you shared earlier, Trini, um, with all of the resources, the books um, and interviews. And then in that, in that, I'm also going to, and then here I go, I want to make sure I've got the, the email. Okay. There we go. Did you just send it to the chat? Or? Yeah, I sent the, the resources. I just want to make sure I'm getting your email correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say uh yeah, even your face is frozen on my my end for some reason. So okay. it looks static to me. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll wrap it up here. Let me just make sure I copy that correctly and get you oops not oh yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, there's Dr. Gonzalez's email address. If anybody uh, would like to send him questions or send him comments based on this presentation, feel free to. Um, and so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Trini, for your time. Uh, this was great. Uh, thank you for not being on the side of the executioner, uh, marketing back to that quote of this <laughs> and being a thinking person. So, um, um, yeah, I'll have this recorded. If students came in late, you could review the beginning of this, um, of the presentation. Uh, I should have it available um, by tomorrow. And for my students, the, the uh, assignment link will be available in Blackboard for the reaction paper for this. Um, and do get a, uh, get a hold of me through Pronto if you have any questions regarding the reaction paper, the extra credit assignment for this. But with that said, yeah, you have a good evening. I really appreciate your, your time on this. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, and again, you know, everybody. Oh, I think we, I think we lost them. <laughs> so thank you everybody for attending and uh, for the great questions. There were some really insightful questions there. And uh, uh, yeah, oh, hi, Laura. <laughs> and and um, excellent. Same for my students, the extra credit assignment is located in the extra credit content folder. That's from uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Chloe. Yeah. Take care, Gabriella. You guys have a good evening. And uh, we'll have another presentation for evening chats this Thursday on an interesting individual named uh, Mother Jones from the early 20th century. She was a labor organizer. So we'll talk about her this Thursday. Take care. You guys have a good evening.